From the University of Notre Dame, these are Notre Dame Stories. For the better part of a year, the mail has been increasingly slow, and COVID is only partly to blame. To find out what's going on here, we spoke with James O'Rourke, professor in the Mendoza College of Business and an expert on corporate communications and reputation, and one of the few who has studied the ups and downs of the U.S. Postal Service for more than a decade. To get started, actually, I wanted to um, lay out a, a scenario for you um, to, to set the stage. My wife runs uh, a small business, and she needs to ship packages across the country. Um, and recently, she shipped a package to Highland, Indiana, which is about you know a little more than an hour due west of our campus here. Um, and it took uh, three weeks to arrive. And I bring that up because um, she's certainly not alone in feeling the frustration with the mail. And so I guess I'd ask you, for folks who maybe haven't felt that or aren't attuned to the situation, what's been going on with the United States Postal Service? Well, I would say uh, the mail has been late. Um, The United States Postal Service for 245 years has been one of the most reliable, most dependable of government agencies and most folks just don't think much about it um if the mail arrives the same time every day you know to two o'clock in the afternoon the postman pulls by in that little white truck and uh, the mail goes into the box we regard that as business as usual but the truth is Um, several factors have contributed to delays in the mail. If you go back to um, January of this year, about 92% of two-day mail arrived on time. Most folks would think, you know, given that you're carrying billions of pieces of mail every year, uh, that's pretty good. On top of that, we have a pandemic, and on top of that, we have an election, and so 92% is pretty good. But by uh, January of this year, the um, the figure fell to about 71% on time. So in a year's time, went from 92 to 71. That's not disastrous, but it's concerning. Three to five day mail which is a separate category, uh, it goes via different routes, and they charge different rates for it. But that went from about 79% on time a year ago in January to about 38% on time in January of this year. Big drop. So, yeah, something something's up. So what what can we say about that? Some of this is the product of long-term neglect. Some of this is the product of a crush of three- to five-day mail, packages, parcels, um, people subscribing to magazines about cooking or pets or you name it. Uh, The mailbox has become a source of entertainment. Uh, It's also... Uh, In addition to UPS, Amazon, and FedEx, it is a way that many merchants get the products we order on the internet or from a catalog uh, to our front door. So let me me choose the easy ones first. Um, It's the, the, the volume of mail has gone up. Um... The packages have gone from 3 billion to 7 billion in uh, a period from 2008 to about 2020. That's a pretty sizable increase. Um, Marketing mail has dropped from about 100 billion to about 66 billion, and first class mail uh, from about 92 to about 53 billion. So some of that is going down. Now, one of the things that means is that the Postal Service is getting less revenue, all right? Um, 
there are a couple of other concerns there. One of them is, and let me see if I've got the figure here, uh, the figure of, yeah, it's just over 16,000 employees quarantining at the moment. Now, they have 644,000 employees, and so that may not seem like a lot. Um, but, you know, the fact is, if you're, if you're down 16,000 employees, um, it's going to hurt. Simultaneously, the Postmaster General said, no overtime available to local postmasters. You cannot use uh, much needed cash reserves to pay overtime. Not much talked about, but there is a similar issue with retirees. Uh, the Postal Service has, I, you know, I'm just going to wag this and say, easily half of the Postal Service employees are over 55. A number of them during the pandemic and under the crush of all that mail simply decided to retire. They took the benefit at whatever point and said, uh, while I would like to keep working, I'm not going to. So they retired and the Postmaster General has not, in general, has not replaced them. So the Postal Service is down a number of employees. At about the same time, along in August or so of last year, a fellow called Louis DeJoy was, well, it was in June, he was appointed Postmaster General, but he really got his spurs on and began to, you know, go to work. Uh, he began shutting down uh, warehousing operations, uh, regional postal centers, and he began prioritizing post offices to close. Well, you know, congressmen in rural districts don't want to hear that kind of thing, so he got some pushback. Um, but he pushed ahead. He said, well, what else is open to me? He said, I've got um, equipment that I can warehouse. It's not going to save me much. I have employees who've retired, and I'm not going to replace them. Um, I'm certainly not going to pay overtime, time and a half, for employees to deliver on the brand promise. And the brand promise was every letter, every day, every customer. And if it were five o'clock at the post office in Granger and there was still mail there, somebody would come in and work overtime and would deliver that to mail. It was as simple as that. Uh, the Postmaster General said no. He went to specify delivery times, um, mail out of a, a postal service center in Portland, Maine, will go to uh, 25 small towns in Maine. The truck leaves at 10 o'clock. A, a kind of rigid set of priorities didn't make a lot of sense. Um, it was pretty clear to me that Mr. DeJoy had <clears throat> clear marching orders from the administration. Um, and and it, it, the president doesn't directly appoint the Postmaster General. The president appoints members of the Board of Governors. And the Trump administration let the Board of Governors drop to uh, a group of five. So the Trump administration appointed four of those folks. There was one Democrat in that group. And so they gave directions they appointed Louis to Joy and Louis to Joy appointed the the deputy and he had pretty clear instructions on what he was to do. So as I began going back through my notes and I'm looking at this, I said he's deliberately chosen to cripple the postal service. This isn't fatal. This is all fixable. Um, if you go back and, and you would say why would they wish to cripple the Postal Service? Well, that's a much more difficult question. But I can I can tell you that a, a couple of congressional investigations and a couple of private journalistic investigations have turned up a fairly simple ideological reason for that. And if you go back to the George W. Bush administration, um, you you find a couple of folks whose fingerprints are all over this, um, an urgency 
took hold among neoconservatives saying there are parts of the United States government we can sell. Let, let me ask you this. You, you, um, you ticked off a number of things that happened you know, in the last year, and then we go back to the Bush administration in 2006. 2006. That's a seminal year. Um, and, and it sounds like a good deal of privatization starts at, at that time. Yes, um, but it, one major event in 2006 really triggered, just pushed the Postal Service out the window. And that was the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. Now, everybody's in favor of accountability, and I don't know anybody who wouldn't like a little enhancement. So, you know, that bill flew through the Senate, and a number of things are in that bill that are troublesome. But right up front, the requirement to fund retirement health care for postal workers and it was running about 15, well, 14 billion at the time. It's about 16.9 now. And it had a 10 year clause in there and said, you got to pay this in every year. Well, that vastly exceeded the net revenues of the Postal Service. They were in real trouble at that point. The postal workers have their own retirement health care system and they pay nothing for it. They got that because when it was set up, it was affordable. The post office had plenty of money. Post office has no money now, and uh, cash reserves, revenues are going to meet um, a point at which they're going to have to lock the door. And I will tell you that that point is probably next August, at which they will be out of money. They can't buy motor gas. They can't pay employees. They can't pay um, vendors for supplies. So that's a serious moment. That that retirement system has about seventy-eight billion in its trust fund right now. So I think the the simple explanation is you go to the Congress of the United States and you say, look, number one, let's move those who are on the postal retirement system into Medicare and let's pay for what they would have earned had they paid along the way. Okay, and then we'll pick up and let them pay the quarterly bill for Medicare. Uh, let's use the rest then, which would be, uh, in my judgment, um, between 48 and 50 billion to pay down postal service debt, to modernize the, the delivery services, uh, to, to do a number of the things that they deeply need right now. So I know they're thinking about that. And the Postal Workers Union, by the way, said Medicare would be fine with us. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the, 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 the curiosity is that there's been very little movement on that. That's, you know, that's a cost control issue. There are ways to raise money, and we can talk about that. There are services the post office ought to be providing. Well, l- let me ask you this. Th- this starts in 2006. I guess, you know, we are now um, 15 years hence. And we've had different parties in power. Was the move in 2006 such a drastic sea change that we couldn't right the ship in that intervening time? Or why has this kind of been allowed to, to yeah. progress? Really good question. Well, two answers. I think the prime motivators in the Bush administration back in 2006 wanted this outcome so they could privatize the Postal Service. Um, that's speculative on my part, but I've, I've been following the revenues and cost structure for a while. And as I, I have told my friends, there is no faster way to clear out a three meter circle around yourself at a cocktail reception than to declare that you follow the revenues and cost structure of the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> that, that'll do it. Uh, people suddenly have somewhere else to be. <clears throat> so... That's number one. I will tell you quite honestly, number two, the Obama administration took their eye off the ball. They had a number of other issues, and they didn't have total control of both the House and the Senate. And there were a lot of other things they wanted to get done. And again, somehow the post office didn't make the list. Then the Trump administration came in and said, eh, things are going just the way we had hoped. And in point of fact, we see no reason to change. You've got to find new sources of revenue. Mm -hmm. You ready for one? Yes. Okay. Community banking. The United States Post Office is 
positioned, I think, uniquely. Unlike any other enterprise on earth to conduct community banking, one third, and it's about 32%, but 32% of all American adults above the age of 18 have no bank. They have no bank account. They have no savings. They have no checking. So what do they do? Well, they go to payday lenders. They go to check cashing services. And I am happy to tell you that most of them operate in a predatory fashion that would shock the conscience. Um, it, it, it just, the, the percentage they take, the percentage they keep is unconscionable. The post office could cash checks for you. The post office could deposit checks. A $500 account is nothing that the mega banks want. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, U.S. Bank, none of those people want $500 accounts. It, there is so much churn in the account that every transaction requires a fee, and the post office wouldn't charge the fee. There would be a, a flat fee to keep the account open. And then if you send a money order or a remittance overseas, there would be a small charge for that. But they could do that, and you multiply that by tens of thousands of transactions a day, and you could have a reasonably interesting flow of cash. The clerks are trained to do it. Uh, they've got the computing capability. Your post office is conveniently located. I think community banking, um, you know, I, I don't like the phrase no brainer. I think it is low hanging fruit. I think it is really easy for them to do that. Hmm. I want to talk about, yeah, I want to talk about this current moment we're in. Louis DeJoy last week um, appeared before the House Oversight Committee. What did you make of that testimony? And and I'm interested especially in your um, thoughts on uh, perhaps his most memorable line from that session. Get used to me. Get used to me. Yeah. What what, what did you make of that? Oh, geez. I would say, look, Mr. DeJoy is a bright fellow. He certainly was a capable executive, and if properly motivated, I think he would. And what do I mean by proper motivation? I mean service to the American people, right, as opposed to political motivations. Um, so I would say um, he's he's got this wrong. He has proposed um, a couple of things. First of all, he has proposed that um, the Congress of the United States um, alter the bill that's moving through the House right now. Um, and he suggested that service should slow down. Uh, number one, he's saying that he wants to redefine two-day mail. He wants to redefine what local means. Local, if you were in South Bend, would probably include Southwest Lower Michigan. It would probably include everything over to Gary, uh, not quite over to Fort Wayne, but certainly down as far as Kokomo. He would say, nah, we're looking at city limits, okay? So everything else goes to three to five day. So he wants more service cuts. A number of things that would happen. One of the first things he suggested is that mail which flies by air around this country in the cargo holds of commercial airliners, uh, Delta, United, Southwest, you know, a number of airlines, I can tell you Frontier Airlines uh, paid the bills, kept the lights on and the doors open by flying the mail. And that was after World War II. Um, and that, that met their costs. And then the passengers were additional revenue. They became successful. And, you know, airmail became uh, a reliable thing. First of all, the airlines are hurting for money and they don't want to hear this. They, they want those contracts back. So service cuts, your mail is going to get slower and slower. Um, he wants higher and region specific pricing. So where his cost structure is higher, he wants to charge more. It's going to cost you more for a first class stamp uh, in the city of Houston or in the city of Philadelphia, then it will cost you if you're in Wichita or Grand Rapids. Region-specific pricing, I think, is fraught with peril. Um, 
a, a congressman in the hearings said something that I thought was pretty interesting. Jim Jordan, who is uh, actually a Republican, was speaking to the Republican, Mr. DeJoy, and he asked him about the diminishing expectations for service, and he heard Mr. Joy's response, it's going to have to cost more and you're not going to get what you used to get. Um, Representative Jerry Conley of uh, Virginia stepped in and he said, uh, <laughs> he called um, the assertions gaslighting because they didn't change the fact about mail delays. And then he said, what you seem to want to do is change the rules to build in to the Postal Service requirements lower expectations. Mm. And uh, that just doesn't seem fair. Doesn't seem fair to the men and women of the Postal Service who work very hard every day to make this happen. Doesn't matter what the weather is. You know, if you've got a walking route with that bag on your shoulder and you're dodging the dogs, that's hard work. That's hard work. And, you know, I, I would say for myself, I think, they're underappreciated. So um, Louis DeJoy says lower expectations, higher prices, and um, much less is going to fly by air. Now, he did say we can't get from New York to California in a truck, so we're going we're gonna to have to fly it. Um, somehow Amazon seems to have found a way to make you know shipping free. Uh, they've got their own airplane fleet. They're now flying Corona vaccine. Uh, around the country. Uh, there are Amazon trucks in the street. And the irony in the end is that if you lose the post office and no one buys up the assets, you're going to have three shippers, UPS, FedEx, and Amazon. And despite all the animosity between the government and Amazon, Amazon's going to move into that space and they're going to do well. So I think now is a moment of reckoning for the Postal Service. But I do think bringing in people who have um, different kinds of experience to the Postal Governor's Board. A uh, woman was nominated, not yet appointed, but you know she's going up to the Senate for hearings. She is the um, director of a vote by mail organization in Denver, Colorado. She works for free. It's a not for profit. Um, one of the, the, the other two uh, nominees include a former letter carrier and a former union official. Now you would say, okay, those guys are probably Democrats. Yeah, I would agree with you. They probably are. But I would also say they may know something about this. And maybe it's time to move in that direction. So four of those seats, there's one temporarily occupied. Four of those seats come open. Three of them are open now. And the other one comes open very soon. So they will have a 5-4 majority, the Biden administration, to appoint a new postmaster general. So to Mr. DeJoy, I would say freshen up your resume uh, because you may you may need that. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you this. Um, you know, again, we saw sea changes. We saw political moves here uh, in the past decade and a half. And yet the problem persisted. I guess, how optimistic are you that with a with new leadership that we can turn this around? Well, Previous administrations who were accustomed, I mean, this, please, you're, you're talking about a government that hasn't had a budget bill in the last 20 years, right? We deal with continuing resolutions. We <laughs> deal with COBRA. COBRA means the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. They throw everything into a bag and say, take it or leave it. Here you go. And uh, <laughs> so we're accustomed to brinksmanship. You know, I would say you're going to see brinksmanship, and I, this may one run well into the summer, but when the Postmaster General announces that he's got 30 days cash reserve, I think the alarm bells go off. And those 30 days cash reserve are going to happen sometime in August. It's going to happen before football season starts, if we have one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the point at which uh, – 
people in the Congress of the United States will start pounding the desk and say, well, this is just outrageous. How could this happen? <laughs> right. So I, I have full confidence they will solve the problem. And I've got some good ideas for them. They're not talking to me, by the way, that nobody's called me. Uh, the only people calling me are the Washington Post, the Associated Press and others. But I would say they can do this. Uh, but I would not be optimistic that they will do it with a big cushion. The last thought I will leave you with, however, is we've seen democracies die around the world, in the Philippines, in Turkey, in Egypt, um, and now most recently in Myanmar, formerly Burma. Um, I don't think you can run a democracy without a postal service. People need to be able to send things to one another without the government opening up their mail and having a look. I, I think a postal service is an essential element of a democratic society, and I, I want to help protect ours. James O'Rourke, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Notre Dame Stories is produced by the Office of Public Affairs and Communications. I'm your host, Andy Fuller. Our music is by Alex Mansour. 